Hi, everyone. It looks like it's just about 2 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Mountain Time, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone, to the NSSC virtual lecture series and today's talk on containment and surveillance. This event is co-sponsored by the Nuclear Science and Security Consortium, a multi-institution initiative focused on training the next generation of nuclear security professionals while engaging in research and development with the national labs in support of the nation's non-proliferation mission. The NSSC works with seven partner universities and five national laboratories, including LANL and Sandia National Laboratory, and is based out of the University of California, Berkeley. The talk today is part of the NSSC virtual learning series, planned to support continued connection between students and national laboratory subject matter experts, particularly during the global pandemic. If you're interested in joining the NSSC community, you can get in touch through the email address listed on this slide. Opportunities with the NSSC include a bi-weekly mailing of job postings and events, additional online lectures, and conferences and summer programs focused on nuclear security science technology and policy. Our speaker, Dr. Smart, will present her talk, and then we'll have time for questions afterward. Please use the Q&A feature to ask your questions, and I'll be keeping an eye out for them to ask Dr. Smart at the end of her lecture. So you're joined this afternoon by Dr. Heidi A. Smart, a principal member of the technical staff in the International Safeguards and Engagements Department at Sandia National Laboratories in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She received her PhD in electrical engineering from the University of New Mexico in 2005 with an emphasis in applied electromagnetics. Heidi has worked in nuclear nonproliferation since 1997 with early work focused on remote monitoring systems and information assurance for communication systems in international safeguards. While working on her PhD, Heidi gained experience in spectroscopy and imaging systems, eventually completing her dissertation on methods to improve the detection of targets with both spatial and spectral characteristics in hyperspectral imagery. Her more recent research interests have involved tags, tamper indicating devices, tamper indicating enclosures, and containment surveillance approaches and technologies. So with that, welcome Heidi, and I will get my screen off for you. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Um, does that look good? Can you see the slide? Looks good to me. Okay, sounds good. Um, okay, uh, thank you for the introduction and um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm talking today, um, as the intro suggested, on containment surveillance. And um, I want to assure you, it looks like I have a lot of slides, um, but a lot of this is uh, just for your reference material. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm not going over everything in there. So you'll see some things grayed out and I'll just skip through those parts. Okay, uh, so in this presentation, I discuss how containment and surveillance, which is often shortened to the word CS, fits into international nuclear safeguards. I'll provide some formal definitions. I'll describe how CS is deployed and some criteria for both technical capabilities and approaches. And finally, I'll provide examples of equipment and technology uh, used by the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, and as I mentioned, some parts will be grayed out for future reference. Uh, so I wanted to start with something fun. Um, this is a uh, movie poster that's been created uh, for one of the projects I'm working on that has to do with tamper, uh, in particular, uh, tamper indicating enclosures. Uh, so in this scenario, the adversary bypasses the keypad that provides the opening of the lid and penetrates the enclosure directly instead, hoping to gain access to valuable materials without anyone noticing. Of course, the enclosure has incorporated tamper indicating materials and thus is cooling. Throughout this presentation, for fun and relevance, I would challenge you to think about scenarios from movies or books where an adversary with authorized access to a facility, so insider threat, is able to tamper with something. Um, sometimes I think of Ocean's Eleven, for instance, um, not necessarily from an insider threat perspective, um, but uh, still relevant, where the security cameras are packed such that the feed is no longer a live feed, 
Um, and I guess I'm giving away the movie if you haven't seen it, but um, basically allows the thieves to steal without immediate detection. Um, and there are a lot of examples um, in, in our everyday lives uh, where you'll see tamper indication um, in uh, your everyday world. And so here's one. Um, I'm sure I looked very sketchy, but I was taking pictures um, on United Airlines of the galley. Um, and you'll see in purple, there's this, uh, a line pointing to um, this purple device. And what do you think the purpose of the device is? Would it prevent a passenger from gaining access to the compartment? It should not. Um, although passengers shouldn't have sharp objects on the plane to cut this off, it's really meant to indicate that someone has accessed the compartment. I'm not sure what's in there, but um, it's clear that United wants to know if someone's been in there, perhaps they, they would have to re-inventory uh, whatever's inside there. Um, I found another recent example um, and, uh, in, in, in the pandemic world where hotels are using tamper-evident adhesive seals to seal already sanitized rooms. And so if someone were to uh, remove the, the adhesive seal, there would be indication that that room had been entered. Um, and again, if you look in your everyday surroundings, you'll find tamper indicating devices or seals everywhere. So to back up to a high level um, and talk about CS at the high level and how it fits with international nuclear safeguards, uh, there are several elements to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty or NPT. Uh, it forbids non-nuclear weapon states from developing nuclear weapons. It forbids the five declared nuclear weapon states from transferring the technology to other states. It commits member states to pursue good faith negotiations toward achieving disarmament. And it explicitly provides for international safeguards, which provides assurance to the global community that states are using technolo nuclear technologies for peaceful purposes. So the four items listed here are key articles within the treaty. Uh, the NPT is also considered to have three main pillars non-proliferation, disarmament, and peaceful use. And I put in, in bold down at the bottom of this slide um, that adverse conclusions are report reportable to the UN Security Council, and so it's critical that any conclusions drawn um, about a state are drawn from valid information, and that's absolutely critical. Focusing more on the International Safeguards Key Article, there is a specific technical objective, um, and I'll read it because um, it's something that uh, is repeated all the time. So it's, quote, the timely detection of diversion of significant quantities of nuclear material from peaceful nuclear activities to the manufacture of nuclear weapons or of other nuclear explosive devices or for purposes unknown in deterrence of such diversion by risk of early detection. And so to verify compliance with the treaty, we use technical measures. Basic verification is nuclear material accountancy, or NMA, which is achieved through inspections, examination of records and reports, and material measurements. Once an inspectorate has verified nuclear material using NMA, it must either maintain a constant vigil over that material to assure that it can detect any tampering with the material, or re-verify the nuclear material on a required frequency. Re-verification can be costly and time-consuming for both the inspectorate and the facility operator. Uh, since human surveillance would be rather intrusive to the operator and expensive for an inspectorate uh, to maintain a constant vigil over materials in the world, safeguards can apply containment surveillance or CS measures. Uh, so once a measurement is performed, CS technologies can be applied to maintain what is known as continuity of knowledge between inspection intervals. So an inspector can walk away um, and we need to trust that these CS technologies have maintained our knowledge of that material as measured. The role of CS is expanded under the additional protocol, adding unattended and remote monitoring capabilities. This allows the IEA to reallocate resources to focus on more qualitative safeguards measures. Uh, the next few slides provide definitions of CS, uh, typically taken from the IEA safeguards glossary, which is actually um, now 10 years old, uh, has not been republished yet. 
um, another document called the IEEA Techniques and Equipment and uh, from Texas A&M. Uh, and those, I believe, are provided in the back of these slides. Um, so note that in addition to reducing the need for remeasuring previously verified items, CS measures are applied to ensure verification of items are not duplicated and to ensure that IEA or other inspector instruments and supplies are not tampered with. So you'll see a lot of technologies um, that are actually protecting inspectorate equipment and supplies. Um, on this slide, I uh, just want to point out that besides being cost-effective to apply containment surveillance, it can reduce the level of intrusiveness of inspections to, to the facility operator, um, and that's really important. I'm going to get into this on the next slide so I can have some pictures. Um, so the word containment refers to the structural features, which may be walls of a storage room, uh, containers, or even the physical integrity of safeguards equipment. Uh, for instance, that IEA rack on the right side. Uh, containment is the integrity of those walls. The continuing integrity of the containment is assured by seals or surveillance measures especially for containment penetration such as doors, vessel lids, and water surfaces, and by periodic examination of the containment during inspection. A suitable containment should be such that any breach um, would be highly impractical, difficult to hide, or apt to be detected with high probability through CS measures. Um, and so note, um, in this definition, they're, they're explicitly mentioning that things such as doors might be sealed, but the entire containment has to be periodically examined, um, and that an adversary can't repair um, uh, that penetration or tamper attempt to those structural features. The term surveillance is the collection of information through inspector and or instrumental observation aimed at detecting movements of nuclear material or other items and any interference with containment or tampering with IEEA equipment, samples, or data. The IEEA inspectors may carry out surveillance assignments continuously, which um, is impractical, uh, or periodically at strategic points. And that does happen, especially during um, on-site campaigns where an inspector might come in to witness an event um, and then apply CS measures after he or she leaves. Um, and so in the images, the first one is uh, the eyes representing the inspector who's physically present on site. Um, the fisheye camera system, uh, I'll talk a lot about that later. So that would be something you could set aside, um, watch an area um, to capture imagery. And um, surveillance might also mean um, other unattended equipment that can help you determine a movement of equipment. And so here there's a mobile unit for neutron detection that could be considered surveillance as well. Okay, so we define containment and surveillance. Some additional questions then are how is CS deployed? Where is equipment placed? What equipment is appropriate for a facility? How is CS verified? And what happens if CS equipment indicates tamper? In terms of how CS applied, it's based on diversion scenarios for a particular facility um, and whether material is direct or indirect use. There are general guidelines for application, but certainly nothing pre predefined. Um, there are various levels of coverage for diversion paths. Um, for example, an approach called dual CS is applied for difficult to access material or items. In this case, each credible diversion path is covered by two CS devices which are functionally independent and not subject to common tampering or failure mode. Uh, and to give an example, um, in German spent fuel storage facilities, there are two different types of seals that are applied to spent fuel storage containers. Um, and I don't think I get into it later, but there's an active seal often applied um, and then a passive seal or two passive seals that have um, very different capabilities and features. Um, and then surveillance cameras are very often uh, pointed uh, at the items that you're monitoring as well. Each CS device has different methods or approaches for verification. Uh, for example, a metal cup seal, which I'll talk about in a bit, uh, is physically 
physically examined for signs of tamper. So the wire might be physically examined. It might be tugged to ensure that it's intact and that it's intact inside of the seal body. Uh, it cannot be pulled out of the seal body. The seal number and location is noted and the containment in which the seal is attached would be examined as well. Uh, based on the inspector's findings, uh, the CS measure may be deemed uh, conclusive positive, conclusive negative, or inconclusive. And these determinations may trigger a follow-up action, such as potential re-verification of material. There are quite a few considerations for CS equipment requirements and technical capabilities. Uh, so I'll just name a few. Uh, most important is having high confidence that deployed equipment has not been counterfeited or tampered with. Uh, equipment is often qualified to be a vulnerability reviews during the design and development phases, and a third-party vulnerability assessment uh, would be done before inspectorate acceptance. Um, so for instance, if a um, developer is developing and designing a piece of CS or other safeguards equipment, um, they could employ um, someone to do a vulnerability review, which might point out um, potential, fail potential failure paths, uh, but ultimately another separate country from the one that's developing the equipment would be brought in to do a full vulnerability assessment um, and make recommendations on that. Um, some of the confidence in the equipment includes physical attributes and data for electronic systems. Uh, for example, a physical attribute could be uh, this solder scratch pattern that um, the IEA puts inside of metal cup seals and used for unique identification. And an example of electronic systems is using photography for authenticating generated data to ensure it is valid. Another consideration is that since CS equipment is deployed between inspections, it must function reliably during this time. Um, and this could be months to years. And so um, this equipment has to be very robust, um, not only to the environment in which it's deployed, but also reliable components. And so if you have an electronic component inside that's prone to failure, um, that's quite a problem. Uh, and let's see. Including remote verification and interrogation can reduce inspection effort if the CS equipment is compatible with those capabilities. Um, and so um, for unattended CS systems, having the ability to remotely um, transmit data, um, which falls under the additional protocol, is extremely helpful in terms of reducing burden uh, to the inspector and, of course, to the operator. Um, and Lastly, on the slide, it should not be difficult for an inspector to verify the CS equipment's conclusiveness. So as an inspector looks at a piece of equipment, it should be clear um, whether it's uh, been tampered with. So while I gave some formal definitions earlier in slides from the IA Safeguards Glossary for the word containment, um, I've always found this description of containment extremely informative and complete. Um, you might notice, however, the definition focuses on structural features with containment integrity provided by applying seals and or surveillance measures in periodic examination of the containment during inspection. The description on this slide focuses more on the entire system uh, and seems to equate the word containment with seals. Um, however, it does not mention the importance of um, surveillance. Um, and so really from this, I just want to point out that um, there's a sealing system. Um, and so that would be um, a means of applying the seal, such as the wire, the seal itself, and the containment. And all three of those are critical um, uh, for the system. Okay, so we've mentioned the word seals um, throughout. Tamper indicating device is synonymous with, with the word seal, and I tend to use both quite a bit. Um, it is not a lock. Uh, that's sometimes a misconception. Uh, we're not trying to prevent someone from access. Uh, we just mainly need to provide evidence of access. Um, so they're designed to leave non-erasable unambiguous evidence of access or entry. So think back to the um, seal on United. It wasn't meant to um, deter someone, or well, it, it perhaps does deter someone, uh, but if someone wanted to get in, they absolutely could. 
Now, a seal like that um, is not the type of seal that we use um, for safeguards, and you'll see some of the features um, as we as we kind of walk through temper indicating devices or seals. Um, so seals are used to join the movable segment. So think door, um, a window, or a recognized opening, um, such that uh, access to the content is secured by its application and becomes impossible without opening the seal, cutting the wire, or breaking the containment itself. Um, so seals can be active or passive. I'll give some examples of these. Um, some seals are single use, so once it's deployed to the field, it has to be cut off and taken back to headquarters to be uh, completely verified. Um, and some seals can be verified directly in the field. Uh, so for the rest of the presentation, I'd like you to look at each example technology, and in particular, think about how it incorporates a unique identifier such that it cannot be counterfeited, and what tamper indicating features are incorporated. And I'll try to point them out if I have an action on the slide. So we'll start with the workhorse seal of the agency. Um, CAPS, ECUP, metal seal, all those terms are used. Um, the IEA tends to use uh, four letter acronyms for their equipment. Um, and so they would maybe call it CAPS, but um, again, ECUP or metal cup seal. Uh, it's small, uh, I don't have the dimensions on there, but perhaps um, half an inch to an inch in diameter. Uh, passive, it's single use loop seal that has, has its wire threaded through the hasp of a monitored item. And so in the um, picture with the bolt, the wire is threaded through the um, item it's monitoring. The wire ends are then placed um, or threaded through the seal. Um, they are crimped or knotted or both inside the seal and the seal is snapshot. So that's generally how the seal works. Um, it's survivable in extreme conditions, very physically robust. Um, and to verify its identity, which um, should be the unique identifier, Prior to deployment, the IEA uses solder and scratches a random, random pattern inside the seal, an image is taken for later reference, and then when the seal is brought back physically to the IEA, the seal can be opened and the interior pattern uh, verified against the reference image. And this tends to be um, pretty labor intensive. And so the IEA has been looking for a new seal to replace the seal for quite some time, uh, but they would very much like a seal similar to this one in terms of size, uh, diameter, weight, um, robustness, simplicity, and cost of the seal. Um, and so that's ongoing. In fact, they just put out um, another call for new ideas um, just last week. Here are just some additional pictures um, that show uh, the knot, the crimp, uh, and the solder and scratch patterns on the inside. Adhesive seals, I mentioned those um, for the hotel room doors. Uh, they're often used for short-term sealing applications. They're made of a special material that cannot be removed without evidence of seal damage and cannot be reattached. Uh, there's some different types of these. Some leave adhesive residue on the monitored item itself and others um, destroy essentially the seal itself. Uh, but regardless, uh, they cannot be reattached. Um, since I used to fly all the time and don't anymore, um, next time you are on a plane, if you're in the airplane restroom, uh, there are often adhesive seals on the fire alarm panel inside the restroom. Obviously they wanna make sure no one's tampering with the fire alarm. Um, and uh, in fact, there, there are seals all over the airplane. Another small passive robust loop seal is the Cobra seal, uh, known by the IEA as FBOS. Uh, like the metal cup seal, the seal's fiber loop is threaded through a hasp on the monitored item. Um, so here you can see, okay, so once the fiber is inserted into the seal, so it's, it's wrapped around the item, inserted into the seal, there are these retaining pins that you can see um, in the middle picture, um, the large picture, um, that hold the cable in place, and then the inspector is able to operate a tool with a cutting blade that randomly slices some of the fibers in the cable, which create unique patterns when you illuminate it. And so on the 
top right picture, you can see the fiber bundles inside. And you can imagine if you were to shine light from the other side um, to the front, if it wasn't sliced as it is, all the um, uh, fiber strands would light up. But with this tool, some of those are cut. And so when you illuminate it, you get a unique pattern. And I think I have that on uh, the next slide. Um, and um, let's see, I'll move on to the next slide. So that middle pattern gives um, uh, the numeric indication of the seal ID, um, which of course is not unique, but that pattern that you see is actually the fiber strands in the cable. And um, so it, therefore it'd be very difficult for someone uh, to replace the cable or to tamper with the cable. And you'll notice um, sort of some speckles outside of that area. Um, reflective particles are embedded in the sealed body for counterfeit deterrence. Um, so uh, you can see the readers um, on the left side, the eye reader is a modified iPhone. And um, when you insert the seal in, uh, you can get the reference and the verification patterns. And um, using a blink test, you can see uh, if those uh, reflective particles in the sealed body um, are still as you expected them. Uh, the other picture on the right, um, that's actually the legacy reader uh, using a Polaroid. And uh, believe it or not, there's still quite a bit of interest in using um, analog cameras, um, Polaroids, um, non-digital cameras uh, for situations where a facility would not allow in something like an eye reader or a modified iPhone. Um, and so we have had to go out onto eBay and um, acquire Polaroid film for some of these other applications. There are scenarios where a seal needs to be applied in extremely harsh conditions, such as underwater. Um, and uh, if the container has not been designed for application of CS, which most things are not designed for CS, uh, the ultrasonic sealing bolt can replace one of the standard bolts of the container lid. Um, and there are a couple of features in the seal, um, sort of on the right where you see the spiral, those metal frangible discs, um, or those, sorry, those random pattern of metal discs provide a unique signature when interrogated with an ultrasonic pulse. And there's also a frangible element in the seal that breaks if an attempt is made to remove the seal. Um, and so there's the tamper indication as well as the unique identification. This is a legacy seal that's been replaced by this seal here. Um, and so the next few slides, I have three electronic seals that I'll talk briefly about. Um, the advantage of using an electronic seal is they can securely record the opening and closing of the cable, um, which might be used to compare to uh, surveillance footage uh, or opera, uh, operator declarations. Um, and they can also uh, securely record penetrations or tamper directly into the case. Um, and these are reusable, so you can use them over and over during the seal's lifetime, uh, which might be useful in situations where you actually do have to open the seal to access something, perhaps an equipment cabinet, but you want to know what times um, that cable was opened and shut. Um, some of these seals also include remote data transmission. In this case, the EOS seal um, like the other seals, you um, thread the fiber, um, the monitored fiber cable um, through the monitored item, plug it back into the seal body, and it sends pulses through that cable um, to detect if it's open or shut. Um, and you can see the reader uh, in the lower picture. The EOS has to physically be attached to a laptop with um, reader software in order to download information from the seal. Um, all the information um, is signed digitally, um, so there's authentication. If the facility would require it, there would be encryption of messages. Um, and let's see, the other important thing about EOS um, is the security critical components are wrapped in a conductive foil. And so an operator on site could actually change the batteries of the system without ever um, uh, coming into direct contact with the security critical components of that seal. And so that's a 
very nice feature. Okay, let's see. So this is, a, I'd say, a prototype seal that the IEA is working on. It's called the Active Optical Loop Seal, or AOLS. Um, JRC ISPRA is being uh, tasked as the design agency uh, with the requirements coming directly from the IEA for how to build this seal. Um, it was designed to cost less than the EOS seal. The EOS is relatively expensive. Um, and a big difference is that the EOS uses um, symmetric key cryptography, uh, so a pair of private keys, whereas um, this seal uses asymmetric key, uh, which makes key management a lot easier, um, and it can allow joint use between separate inspectorates. And so two inspectorates can each have their own key and verify uh, the authentication of messages coming from the seal. Remotely monitored sealing array is also an electronic fiber loop seal, but instead of physically attaching a reader to verify the seal, the seal sends its integrity and status, status uh, which might mean case tamper, state of health, and fiber opened or closed via authenticated and encrypted wireless transmission to a central translator. Um, so the seal itself is shown physically on the left, um, but if you had uh, uh, a bunch of items in a, a facility that needed to be monitored, you would attach the seals uh, to those items and they communicate open, shut, um, uh, temperature, um, and uh, case tamper to this thing called the RMC translator. An inspector then could go into the room um, on site and use a laptop um, and a VPN, a virtual private network connection, uh, to download data or view data. Or this could also go over the internet um, using virtual private network technology as well. Um, I think I didn't mention in the last couple of electronic seals, the unique identification for electronic seals um, is typically done um, electronically uh, using cryptography. And so the unique ID would come in that fashion. Um, and tamper indication, it depends on the seal. I mentioned the EOS seal. Um, I believe the AOLS on the last slide also has some kind of conductive um, uh, wrapping. And the RMSA seal, um, uh, depending on the version, uses um, an anodized aluminum on the outside, which theoretically makes it very difficult for an adversary to repair any type of attack. Um, there are mechanical tamper switches within the seal body and uh, tempered glass uh, near the security critical components. I've mentioned the need for unique identifiers within seals. Uh, in this presentation to ensure that the seal has not been substituted or counterfeited. Uh, unique identifiers are also known as tags, and there are situations where you don't necessarily need a seal, but you just need a tag. Um, and so those situations are your, your, your uh, identical items, and uh, you need to ensure those identical items are not double counted or substituted. Um, generally, in international safeguards, um, seals with a unique identifier are used, uh, but it's not very often that we use a tag by itself. Uh, but that said, because of the importance of unique identification, even as applied to a seal, um, I'm going to talk about the reflective particle tag. Uh, it's composed of hematite particles mixed into an acrylic matrix that can be applied in the field. And so what you're looking at in these images, um, there is a center almost barcode reader, that would be simply to tell you uh, this is, let's say, tag one, two, three, and that is helping you to look into a database to find the reference images for that same tag quickly. Um, but the real unique identification comes from the reflection of those hematite particles within the tag. So you could just see a little bit of like, um, like the Milky Way in the background there. Those are the hematite particles, and if you shine a light from different angles, at least three different angles, here four are shown, um, you get unique patterns from every one of those images that are used then to verify the seal. It's extremely difficult to counterfeit or duplicate. Um, but the importance of this is when, when a tag or unique ID are mentioned, um, the critical part is could someone 
create the exact same tag? Could they counterfeit this? Um, and so that's why something like a QR code or a barcode are not typically considered a suitable unique identification um, technology uh, in city codes. As I discussed earlier in the presentation, the entire system needs to be considered when determining if continuity of knowledge has been maintained using CS. We just reviewed the ceiling part of the system, and now we'll consider the containment itself. Um, so from the IEA Techniques and Equipment document, quote, comprehensive containment verification needs to include not only the ceiling systems, but also the integrity of the entire surface of the container or enclosure. Um, to ensure that there have been no penetrations which go undetected by the ceiling system. As you can imagine, this, this could be difficult, and we'll get more into that in a moment. Uh, referencing the ASARDA safeguards course, um, quote, in the process of selecting a safeguards approach, all aspects of containment systems must be considered. The containment is as important as the seal that closes it. And finally, the severity of the loss of potential of excuse me, the potential loss of containment integrity should drive the choice of the sealing method and its sophistication. However, even if the perfect seal could be developed and deployed, continuity of knowledge cannot be maintained without also knowing that the containment is intact. And this is actually a very complex issue and still lacking sufficient attention. Um, so here are some of the complex issues. Containments can be inspectorate owned, such as an instrument cabinet, or they could be facility owned, such as a spent fuel container. And so we need approaches that can work for either. Also, containments vary widely in size and geometrical shape. Uh, you can see there could be a containment of an entire room down to the body of a seal. Um, and again, in different shapes and configurations. Uh, so how does one know if a surface has been penetrated and then subsequently repaired? We need to ensure that the tamper is not only objectively detected, but that adversaries cannot repair their tamper attempts. Uh, an inspectorate-owned in instrument cabinet is shown on the left. Uh, this is an older type of cabinet and was painted such that tamper attempts may be difficult to hide or repair. Um, the IEA now uses anodized aluminum. Um, in a similar manner um, for things like the instrument cabinets, um, and as you'll see, some of the surveillance systems, and as I mentioned, in some of the electronic seals. Um, keep in mind that all surfaces, including the backside and underneath, should be examined, and that can be quite difficult. Um, and for facility-owned equipment, such as the cask shown in the middle picture, um, there are a few tamper techniques listed. Uh, I'll just discuss a couple. Um, there's a tamper indicating shrink wrap that you could then wrap around a facility owned item. There's been research into conductive fabric um, and that also would wrap around um, an item um, and it monitors using smart nodes um, if there's been a cut in the fabric. Um, and then there are some intrinsic methods as well to see if there's been any sort of uh, penetration. So this just listed for reference, it's the shrink wrap. Laser mapping, uh, this could be an approach used for facility-owned equipment. Um, essentially, you use a laser to record the unique variations on a surface, and so there might be um, uh, mountains and valleys intrinsically onto the surface. Uh, you would take an initial recording that would become the reference data, um, and then upon returning to the item, you would verify the reference data to a new laser mapping and any tamper attempt should alter the unique variations on the surface. Of course, this is difficult if there's any sort of um, erosion or oxidation, um, maybe even dust on the surface. Okay, um, I've got just less than 10 slides here uh, to let you know where we are. Um, so we're finally moving into surveillance, uh, which as I mentioned, could be actually humans standing around 24 hours uh, or instrument observation. Um, but since it's impractical to have round the clock human surveillance, uh, the IEA often uses optical surveillance systems to provide effective ongoing surveillance when the inspector is not physically present. Um, and so these cameras will be set up such that the field of view um, is covering the entire area of safeguards interest. Um, in terms of 
uh, these surveillance systems are very um, rarely video systems. They are camera systems that take, cam um, take pictures at different intervals. Um, and so one of the considerations is how often do you capture an image? Um, it should be shorter than the fastest removal time of the item that you're interested in monitoring. And you want at least two images so that you can uh, determine direction of movement. Uh, instead of just fixed picture taking intervals, these systems um, can do scene change detection uh, to take images or external triggers. Um, one of the electronic seals, the EOS, EOSS, um, has a uh, direct connection to the optical surveillance systems. And so if someone opens that loop seal, the um, surveillance system will take an image automatically. And really, there are very few surveillance systems authorized for IEA use. Um, almost all of them, uh, except for maybe two types of systems, are based on something called the Digital Camera Module, or DCM series. And what that is, that's really the brains of the camera, and uh, it's the building block. Other systems are built off, off, that, um, off that module. Okay, uh, so a question I get asked a lot is, uh, why not just use a COTS surveillance system? The systems used by the IEA are very expensive, um, but these surveillance systems are not your typical webcam or security cameras. There are very unique requirements that have prevented off-the-shelf systems from being deployed for safeguards purposes. These requirements include operating for extended periods in harsh conditions with very high reliability, and uh, importantly, the ability to authenticate the images that have been taken such that an adversary could not extract images from the camera or modify images from the camera without detection. Um, and finally, uh, there have to be tamper indicating features in the cameras. And most industries don't require this level um, uh, of trust in the system, I suppose. So the DCM-14 has been the standard basis of surveillance systems for around two decades. Um, and as I mentioned, it's really the building block. So these are all DCM-14 based systems. Um, some of them are um, uh, the top left can be used standalone, um, but it might use facility power. Um, the one in the um, middle, Alep, has a significant battery connected to it. And so it really would be standalone. Um, and then they get more complicated from there. Um, some of them are wall mounted. Some of them provide the ability to do remote data transmission. Um, and some of them can be expanded from one camera up to 16 or perhaps beyond um, and communicate to a server. The DCMC5 is the newest building block. Um, the older version, the DCM14 is being um, phased out. I'm not sure. If there are any left, there probably are still some DCM-14 systems still left. Um, but again, the DCM-C5 building block can have um, can form the basis for a standalone camera up to complicated rack-mounted servers. Um, and the NGSS part used to stand for next generation surveillance system, um, but I've heard some people say it's just no longer an acronym since it's not next generation. There actually is now a next next generation um, being investigated. Some of the advanced capabilities of the NGSS um, are, as I mentioned before, it's highly reliable under harsh environmental conditions. Safeguard sensitive data and parts are protected inside an electronically sealed tamper indicating core module, um, which will, would allow replacement and installation of parts by third parties without compromising data authenticity. Um, there's public key cryptography or asymmetric key cryptography um, that would allow um, joint use with other inspectorates. So perhaps your Adam would have a set of keys, perhaps the IEA would have a set of keys, and they could both um, decrypt and authenticate images coming off the NGSS system. Um, let's see, it also supports various trigger signals from other sensors or seals. Uh, it supports remote monitoring, uh, which is now more commonly referred to as remote data transmission. Uh, it's 
got a lot better resolution uh, than the previous versions, and the images are in color. The um, older versions were all black and white. Um, it can also take pictures um, as fast as one image per second. Um, I can't recall what the DCM14 um, interval was, but I think it was much slower. Um, and finally, interestingly, with one camera, you can record up to four different fields of view simultaneously. And um, in some cases, this would replace a traditional camera. And that is the end. I have a few references here um, uh, and some links to them. And so uh, with that, I will take any questions. So Heidi, it looks like there was a question in the Q&A for you, which I think you answered, but maybe you want to add something. And that is, um, what is to keep someone from applying a IEA new seal after they have broken a seal? Does the IEA keep track of which seals have been applied to which items? How do they know if the seal on the item is the original and not another IEA seal that's been applied after the original was broken? I apologize. I might need to stop sharing. Oh, wait. Look in the Q&A. I missed a lot of that, but um, I can actually see it in the chat now. Oh, good. Okay. Okay, right. Yes. Um, the IEA most certainly keeps track of which seals have been applied to which items. Um, they have sheets that they bring along with them, in which case they would say, um, let's say, the seal says one, two, three on the outside, they would write seal one, two, three, where it's been applied. Um, but every seal they apply has to have a unique identifier, and that has to be something the IEA can verify. So if someone did take a seal off an item and replace it with a new one, um, maybe they can counterfeit the human readable portion, but there should be a feature within the seal. Um, I'm not even gonna say should. There is always a feature in the seal um, that that is verified to confirm that it's not been counterfeited. Any other questions? You can type them in the Q and A. I think they come in anonymously. So, oh, here's another question for you, Heidi. Are you there, Heidi? I think there's another question here in the Q and A for you. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't, okay, there we go. Oh boy, I think this is a question for you guys. <laughs> Well, I could speak to the second question we have here from Salim. Absolutely. And this is Charlotte Carr. I'm the program manager of the Nuclear Science and Security Consortium. Depending on what university you are affiliated with, there's a variety of opportunities you can be involved with. If you'd like to just shoot me an email, I can type it into the chat box right now. It's nssc underscore info at berkeley.edu. And feel free to reach out to me if you're interested in just hearing about more opportunities and how you can be involved. It kind of depends on what school you're affiliated with, depending on the level of involvement, but there's lots of opportunities. So we'll have a talk tomorrow, for instance. So please just reach out. And then I think there's also a question from Mitch Negus of UC Berkeley, if Chloe wants to read that. Sure. Um, so Mitchell says, I've heard that states have com expressed concern about remote transmission of their data. Are you familiar with these concerns and why states might adopt that position, especially if the data is encrypted for transmission? Yes, um, there are countries or states that have concerns um, about remote data transmission. Um, 
There have been concerns if you have a surveillance system, for instance, um, monitoring your facility, and perhaps you have um, proprietary activities in your facility that don't fall under safeguards, there's a concern that the IAEA um, would then see something that um, fell outside of safeguards um, that the facility wanted protected. And so um, in many cases, the facility will require, or I suppose negotiate a safeguards agreement with the IAEA um, to delay the transmission of the data up to 24 hours um, such that they can ensure with their own processes that nothing sensitive might have been um, transmitted. Um, even with things like transmitting state of health, again, there are some concerns that um, the agency could glean information um, that wasn't necessarily uh, meant for them. Um, and encryption is really a facility requirement. The IAEA really only cares if the data is authentic. Um, encryption would be added on top of that if the facility is concerned um, about uh, someone, again, finding out information about their facility. Great. Um, so we have a question, another question here from Edward. Has there been any research into quantum state technology for tamper verification, such as quantum entangled particles in the future, as this technology becomes more feasible? On a different track, if an inspector found tamper evidence, what next steps are taken to investigate the incident? Um, let's see, so addressing the first one on quantum, um, I don't have a lot of details, but I am aware of ongoing research um, recently into quantum. Um, not only uh, quantum computing, um, but uh, quantum, uh, quantum seals um, have been discussed um, and work looking at the pros and cons of well, I should say benefits and concerns of quantum as applied to safeguards. Um, so uh, as quantum becomes more prevalent, um, are there threats directly to international safeguard space um, or is it something that would be used um, as an advantage or benefit? So I suspect in the next year um, that you would see information in conferences related to quantum directly for international safeguards. On your second question, um, if an inspector found evidence of tamper, what are next steps taken to investigate the incident? Um, I don't totally know the answer to that. Um, there are tables, of, uh, sort of decision-making um, uh, tables that the IE has published. For instance, if you have a containment and um, uh, I don't know, the operator has more access than an inspector, you can go through a series of uh, questions to find out um, how concerned you are that the containment could be breached without detection. Um, if a SEAL perhaps had evidence of tamper, um, I think it could be taken back to the IEA. Some SEALs you can do post-mortem inspections um, to uh, determine if it was um, seal failure um, or if there was true tamper. Uh, beyond that, if, if it's pointing to the fact that a state might have done it deliberately, um, I honestly am not sure how they handle, um, how they would handle that sort of information that they really thought a state was um, looking to defeat a seal. If, if there is an issue with a seal, sometimes they would have to re-verify the inventory of something that uh, the SEAL would be protecting. And so um, there have been instances that kind of relate to your question. Um, in Argentina, there had been situations where the spent fuel pool um, was being monitored by a, by a surveillance system and the facility lost lighting. And so all of the images during the period when the facility lost lighting um, were just black, they were dark. Um, and so uh, the agency would then have to re-verify at least a portion, maybe a statistical sampling of the material in the pool to verify that it was still all there. Hopefully that partially answers your question. Great. Uh, the next question is, what is the ongoing research for containment 
surveillance systems of Gen 4 reactors, especially molten salt reactor systems? Yeah, okay, so, so uh, molten salt reactors, I'm not sure in particular, but um, for some of the new reactor types, um, there is currently research being done on these systems, um, but I'm not aware of too much work um, in previous years. And so this is another, um, either stay tuned soon, I think there'll be some information on CS systems uh, for these types of reactors. Um, and this could be an area um, that if someone has interest, uh, that they might be able to research um, as it is pretty new. And again, I'm not really aware of much being done, just a little bit. It could be a good opportunity. I guess I have a question for you, Heidi. Okay. Um, do you find that there is significant overlap or any significant differences between containment and surveillance measures for safeguards versus nuclear security? Do you feel like they're pretty much the same? Um, no, so, so that's a great question. Um, and so to repeat it out loud, or is there much overlap between international nuclear safeguards technologies and nuclear security? That's something that, oh gosh, maybe for 10 years, um, at every conference, someone discusses the intersection between safeguards, security, um, and safety. And um, in my experience, while some of the requirements are the same, there are portions that are very different. Um, the threat for international safeguards um, tends to be more um, insider and um, for security, there might be some insider, but there's also a huge element of um, deterrence. And so I would say what, what separates them is the, is the threat, who is the adversary in each case. Um, each might use some of the same seals, but again, they, um, uh, not exactly. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything in nuclear security that is also used in safeguards, and I don't think there is. So, and again, it's really based on the, on the threat level. That's another area. It'd be great if there could be some overlap between these um, between these different regimes or, or spaces. Um, I'd like to see that happen a lot more. Um, I have another question for you. Do you feel like the United States is sort of on the forefront of these technologies? Um, or are there other countries that we could learn from in terms of containment and surveillance? Containment and surveillance is a very small community. Um, so I'm involved with the uh, European Safeguards Research and Development Association, or SARDA, which I did mention um, in this presentation. And there's about eight of us that get together twice a year to discuss these issues. Um, there's a small community also for INMM um, that, that uh, I happen to be the chair of the working group for INMM, and again, the community is very small. Um, in terms of the technologies, um, let's see, they come from all over. So, so yes, the U.S. provides quite a few technologies. Germany provided the EOS seal. Germany provided uh, the surveillance systems. Um, JRC ISPRA um, in Italy provides quite a bit of containment and surveillance equipment. Uh, the ultrasonic ceiling bolt is from them. Um, so they have a heavy hand as well. Um, but I could actually probably name five countries that, that develop containment and surveillance equipment. So. 
it's not a huge market. <laughs> Any other questions from our attendees? Well, hearing none and seeing none, I want to thank everyone for being here and especially thank Dr. Smart for joining us with the awesome presentation. Um, I want to let all of you know that we have another presentation tomorrow at the same time from Dr. Alexis Trahan on NDA technologies, um, and you'll be using the same Zoom link to, to join that meeting as you did for this one. Um, so thank you, everyone. If you have any other questions, you can forward those to the NSSD email provided by Charlotte, and have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.